Okay, my outstanding friends, another day <laughs> of shocking discoveries. I mean, it's just stunning the things that have been missed and overlooked. And a lot of it is because Emanuel Velikovsky was so demeaned by academia that they just shut all that stuff down. His research was just stunningly fabulous. Now, he went to every culture on the face of the earth and said, what did these people record? What was their recorded history? What was their oral traditions? What are their dances? What did they carve? What did they inscribe? What did they write in their roll scrolls and papyruses and, and tablets and all of these things are in these museums, libraries, cultural centers. He went to all of that all of that everywhere in the world south america in the norse everywhere all asia and they all had the same story and what was that story well there was a catastrophe a devastating catastrophe to the entire earth about 3500 years ago all right remember that date 3500 years ago approximately 1500 BC. This is very important. Write that down. 1500 BC, Earth was basically destroyed. And what was the result of that destruction? Well, a lot of humanity was wiped off the face of the Earth and all of the giant creatures that had been developed by this, this insane society which was here prior to the flood. They had animal hybrids and dogs with animal with human heads on them and all, all kinds of giants, huge, enormous giants, dragons, all kinds of insane creatures created by, I don't know exactly what, but I, I have a feeling they were messing around with DNA. That's the only thing I can think of because they were, they were, interbreeding they were making hybrids so they would have a four-legged human but you know you could see all those carvings everybody knows about these carvings and these, these statues to show a bull with a human head on it with a beard I mean it's just insane now what am I looking at here this friend of mine John Hernandez sent me this and because we were talking about granite and he said if all granite is ground up material which was m one of my claims although i didn't say all granite i said my kitchen counters <laughs> are ground up body parts <laughs> that were made back into polymers just like concrete i'm going to show you this and what i discovered they did and i'm sure it's correct is they ground them all up and then they leached all the metals out of them took what was left and either added a little enzymes here and there, or however they did it, or maybe, maybe they just discarded it and it turns a solid hard over a course of time. I don't know, but they're slabbing these things off now and making countertops out of them. So let's first of all look at this video because this is going to show you these granite boxes. This is what John sent me. He said, what do you think is going on here? Did, did they grind up body parts and so forth to make these bo these boxes? And that's possible because they show the wheel of death. Let me show you something. Okay, so I'm going to show you something and I'm going to relate it to granite. And why would I be showing you this? Well, this is tendon. You see this? This is tendon. This is muscle. This is obviously the calf of, of, of a person's foot. And uh, this is the calcaneus. It's really the Achilles heel. And then the Achilles tendon. See it? That big long tendon. That's the longest tendon in your body. Now, what happens at the end of that tendon? And why is that tendon so long? And what does the tendon do? It attaches solidly into a bone or some substrate which locks it in like tighter than you can imagine and then this is almost almost like a, 
like a Texas tire tube. <laughs> that baby ain't gonna give out. It just barely, just barely goes like this. Now, the muscle, whole different thing. Woof, woof, woof. That, so, what happens here? This is what's called an abrupt transition. An abrupt transition means the tendon comes up and bang, it hits right here. It literally glues into the muscle and it becomes part of the muscle and now you have a lot of red blood because this does a lot of work. This is just a rubber band. That's all that is. It's just, just, a, just like a really tough, tough, tough rubber band. When they break, whew, and I'm going to show you what happens. What Sometimes this is what they have to do. <laughs> That's it right there. Yikes. Now, when they rip out, it's uh, it's uh, serious, and I've had a couple of um, surgeries about this. Anyway, this is um, the tendon, and again, you don't see really uh, almost no blood at all in these, and then it's just surrounded by a bloody matrix, and you see all the tissue. There's a lot of things they have really never focused in on. This right here is the interstitium. Everything has a membrane that keeps this away from that. There's a membrane on this that keeps it away from that. You have to have membranes and they are collagen and they depend on bacteria living in that layer which also has a fluid filled highway that runs through your entire body. Another, you know, all, there's, again, I always say there's nothing that sits by itself. Health, structure, chemistry, biology, history, all wrapped up in one big ball. So now, what am I going to be talking about? Granite. <laughs> How did I get from tendons to granite? Well, <laughs> oh, man, it's a circuitous route that you must follow, my friends. <laughs> okay, so now, let's go back to where we started from, which was these unbelievably precise granite boxes and they're all over the place on this I believe it's called Elephantine Island and they also had all these carvings of ram headed gods and you know crazy things I mean literally crazy things like um, I don't know well this kind of stuff I, they had, you know, bird-headed things and people with uh, attached to bulls. And, I mean, it was just, this was the stuff they wanted to wipe off the face of the earth. Now, this was about 4,000 years ago or a little earlier than that. Velikovsky said the destruction of all of these things on earth happened 3,500 years ago. So these were the crazy things they were doing, and God said, no, no more of this. I'm going to take this out. And that's when he wiped out literally everything on earth except some survivors. And there was a, a number of survivors. It wasn't just a few. They, they, but they were way up on the tops of the mountains in the caves and so forth. And they do documented all of these events. And this was everywhere in the world. And they also had glyphs and all this. They all had crazy dragons and giants and monsters and serpents and you know things with many heads and chimeras and I mean it just it went on and on and on in crazy things that were on the earth the earth could not withstand that any longer God said this end of it I'm going to wipe it out and here's what I'm going to do I'm going to send Venus down as a fiery comet and destroy the earth exactly what Velikovsky said and exactly what's recorded and that happened 3500 years ago approximately and this was all during the time of this change in religion. So let's talk about the change in religion from all the gods, which there were just a ton of gods. There was hundreds of them. Literally, there was a god for everything. And then they went to a single god. Why would they do that? Why would they, and the heretic Pharaoh is the one that switched over? Let me let's talk about him. Okay, my friends, most of you know that I wrote a book about Velikovsky, who is my hero, and I believe now I can prove that he was very sound in his statements. Now, not 100%, but we have new information that really 
locks down the fact that he was correct in most everything. Now, there might be some details, but listen to this is what happened. This is in 1974. Now, that's 25 years after the book was written. 1950 was Worlds in Collision. And it was number one bestseller for 11 weeks in a row, and the academics forced the bookseller a publisher to take it off the bookshelves because it was so popular and they were so upset. And then all the way 25 years later, it says by then, in 1974, the controversy surrounding Velikovsky's work had permeated U.S. society. So people are starting to pay attention to this to the point where the American Association for the Advancement of Science <laughs> felt obligated to address the situation as they had previously done in relation to UFOs and devoted a scientific session to Velikovsky's featuring, among others, Velikovsky himself and Sagan, Professor Carl Sagan. <laughs> Sagan gave a critique of Velikovsky's ideas, a very, very arrogant, demeaning critique. The book version of Sagan's critique is much longer than that presented in the talk see below. His criticisms are available and scientists confront Velikovsky. They, they just hated him. And as a corrected and revised version in the book, Broca's Brain, Reflections on the Romance of Science. Now listen to this now. It was not until the 1980s that a very detailed critique of worlds and collisions was made by terms of use of mytho mytho mythical and literary sources, which he went back to all of them, when Bob Forrest published a highly critical examination of them. Earlier in 1974, James Filton published a brief critique of Velikovsky's interpretation of myth which was ignored by Velikovsky and his defenders, whose indictment began, listen to this, this is how he assaulted my hero, in at least three important ways. Velikovsky's use of mythology is unsound. Well, that's because they don't believe in looking at the reality that's on the ground, which I show. The first of these is his proclivity to treat all myths as having independent value. Well, I treat them right now as having very significant value. The second is the tendency to treat only such material as is consistent with his thesis. And the third is his very unsystematic un method. He was the most systematic of all. He searched all the ancient texts and he came up with a conclusion that they all had the same stories and that, but he didn't have the scientific physical evidence I show you. And I do now, so it supports everything he said. A short analysis of the position of arguments in the late 20th century is given by Dr. Velikovsky's ex-associate and Kronos editor, such and such and such, a lesson from Velikovsky. See, more recently, the absence of supporting material in ice core studies has removed any basis for the proposition of global catastrophe. That is ridiculous. Yale has just signed off. Well, not just. Seven years ago, after I presented all my evidence to them, they did sign off saying there was a global catastrophe, worldwide flood, salty silicates that encompassed the entire world, one thin layer, and wiped out and preserved all of the soft-bodied creatures, which is just exactly what I show, precisely, and flat because they died like this. The, and it was a hot salt water flood. This is what they don't understand. It was when Venus almost impacted Earth, and that is what Velikovsky presented. And it basically boiled most of the waters that the people try to jump in to preserve themselves, and they ended up turning into, into um, preserved membranes. The membranes is this fascia. Fascia, I was going to call this fascia facilitated fossilization because I, everything that I had was coated in fascia. And, uh, and this is a DNA tested and it's a lung, a human lung. And fascia really is the coating of everything. This is even a goose. There's his little beak, his eyeball, there's his feathers. 
it all turns into into feldspar which is the collagens and I understand the process now because it's the three chemist chemicals right here phosphorus silicon and aluminum and phosphorus breaks down to create aluminum silicates and all feldspar is a hundred percent of feldspar is aluminum silicates with inclusions of whatever it was close to some kind of blood chemistry or whatever so anyway the, as far as I'm concerned Velikowski was the guy and now I understand exactly why the religions changed they went from many 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 gods and all these monsters hold on one second Okay, this was about Akhenaten, who Velikovsky wrote a book about because he was the heretic pharaoh. And this goes right into that 1500 B.C. era. And, um, you know, um, Tutankhamen, Tutankhamen here, and Hatshepsut and all those. Now, Akhenaten came in around 1353 BC and he was the heretic pharaoh because he said no from now on none of these other gods just one god and think about if you woke up one day and he said okay no more one god everybody goes to church and worships all these gods with all these different heads and rams and everything else what do you think a society would do <laughs> well they weren't real happy about this guy I mean, this was the kind of gods they were worshiping. These, these guys, like they're bulls with human heads on it, with beards, and I mean, the, the most insane, crazy things that you could ever possibly imagine. However, this was all written about, and I have found some of the most insane, crazy things, and I cannot discount that they were doing all this crazy stuff with DNA because they could make these stone boxes and I'm going to tell you I'm going to show you how I think they did it because my countertop is basically made out of the same thing that John said look into this how did they do this did they cold mold these I, I'm pretty sure I understand how they did it now they, they would call them geopolymers but they were using literally bodies and extracting the metals that's my determination at this point and here's my evidence all right don't forget this is the kind of craftsmanship they were doing this I it literally guarantee you this is a geopolymer which was all ground up put into a mold this is the seam on the on the point of like a uh, the apex of a pyramid look at these seams on here and look at the consistency the homogeneousness of this that doesn't happen naturally let me show you how it does happen and how they ground up things and made these out of it all right this is tendons and and, and so forth fatty tissues and everything but this is what they would grind up if they were grinding up a body let me show you a little closer detail on the tendons before we go to that detail don't forget you see all those little black and gooey little red things all over the place well that's going to mix in with the little tendon stuff you see these tendons you know i think i showed you this before anyway this is all going to grind up together if you ground that up that's what you'd have they, this is just so, sewed back in here this is nothing replaced and they wouldn't have any any uh, nylon fibers i'm sure in the but i don't know <laughs> at this point i don't know anymore this is my countertop you see this this my friends i'm I see, I, you know, I've studied geology, what they call geology, very carefully. And this is nothing more than ground up bits and pieces of body parts. There's still some red in here. There's little chunks of black, which is the vein blood. And here's something right here. This is what it looks like before they grind it up. All right, that's in my microscope here in the shop. This is, this is what they're trying to extract out of it is the metals. Whoops, wrong mouse. Hold on a second. All right, there's that one. They're, they're saturated with metals. This is uh, grip skin. That's the real tough stuff. But this is basically what they look like. Hold on. Some of them are like this. Some of them are like this. It depends on where it is in the body. Look at this. Is, this is arteries and veins. Anyway, uh, I have some stuff here on my countertop that I'm going to be showing you, but that is 
as far as I can determine, these chunks have come off of of uh, tendons. That's why there's so many of the white. The the red runs out and gets sort of fluidy. The black stays hard in chunks. Exactly what we see. Now, why do I show this? That's literally as much as I can find of metal in my whole countertop almost. Now, see these, see these chunks right here? Those are little strips of tendon. This black and a red, it was attached to a little piece of, I don't know what that is, maybe it's aluminum, maybe it's silver, I don't know. But there's no more metals that I can find in the whole countertop. Well, I didn't look at every square inch. I mean, I got a lot of countertops. There's about 30 feet of counters. And um, <laughs> that's it. Here it is right up close. You see it? Now, you see that right there? Those are tendons. They're chopped off. They're not just growing there and everything's fine. Those are all just ground up. And who ground them up? Well, maybe this guy did it right here. I don't think I would want to meet up with him. <laughs> Look at this. You pour that out. They leach it out with acids and salts. They reattach all the transition transition metals, leach it down. They end up with that slurry. Either they just put it to the side and it hardened up, or they put it in molds like they did on Elephantine Island and came up with those molds. And these are the kind of people that were doing it, or creatures that were doing it. And God said, no more of this. We we're done. 3,500 years ago, we're going to close the case. And he did. And, and uh, at that point, they still really couldn't get over that there was a lot of gods, because they knew there were. But now, at this point, Akhenaten said, no, it, you know, I don't care how many gods there are. <laughs> Let's go with the one. He's the one that wiped out the earth before. If we don't please him, it's going to happen again. So let's let's do what he said to do. And um, and but it didn't work out really great because the God that they were worshiping, it appears at this point, was Zeus, who was Jupiter, who wiped out the earth using Venus. And this is all in the statements and, and, and documentation and carvings and all that stuff from these, these, this culture. It's, he didn't make all this stuff up. So I'm looking into what it said, and this was the change from a multi-poly, poly, you know, a lot of gods down to a single god. Let's worship the one that took out the earth because he, obviously he's the top god. Obviously he wiped out all the other ones or he at least he got them out of here. That's what it appears to me. Okay, so getting back to John's original question about was this cold molded and how did they do this and how did they end up with this? I, I got a feeling they did add some enzymes or heat or something that it would not solidify quick enough i don't think to satisfy them so i would think they added something now this i don't know this could have just been sitting around and eventually just hardened up into piles and when they discovered this what they would call granite they just started slabbing it off and making counters out of it now this is one type of granite this right here is a lung and I'm going to show you how it's a lung. And what, it died laying like this. And that is right there. You could call that red granite. Or granite. Or one of it's black and red. Now, why is it black and red? Well, that's what happens in a lung. The blood is saturated with blood. And it leaked out. All right. As it died laying like this in the foot. And they, they I have other lungs that are the same thing. Well, here's one right here. That... It didn't leak the blood out of it, but it's saturated with it right here. And it's, it is saturated inside. And this was DNA tested in CAT scan and everything else. And that's where the depression of the heart was. Again, flat. And again, all from the Great Flood. 3,500 years ago. These are all right on the surface of the earth. These are not buried 550 million years ago, like Yale says. That's, that's just nonsense. These are, everything I have here, I just picked up off the ground. 
And you can go out and do the same thing. I, I put the challenge out, 15 minutes. You can go find a rock, you just found a mud fossil. If you know how to interpret it, you understand it. You see that? Oh, that's just a rock. No, incorrect. These are actually blood vessels. This is fascia, which coats and turns into feldspar. And this is what they would call basalt or all kinds of names. Again, flat, died in the flood. I mean, I got them coming out of my ears. And I, I break them open. You see here and look inside and see what's inside. The geologists think this is all the same stuff inside. It's not. The it's, it's feldspar coats all. You see this? This one here. Same thing. And I can, see, I found all of these, what's called interstitium, in these because these are absolutely perfectly preserved, exceptionally preserved, as Yale says. And, and you can see all the details. And some of them are so big that you can see details nobody's ever seen before. So I found this interstitium layer. And, um, and then I just kept going. And then more and more and more details came up. And then I found different species, like this one here. No toes. Hold on. It's a whole new species of type of human. That's a shoe, or not a shoe, it's a foot. That's where the bone comes down in the back, where the foot is. This side is where the fibula is. This is where the tibia comes down, that one right there. And this is where the blood supplies to the toes, but the toes are part of the foot in this. It has a regular arch and everything just like ours. It has a little thumper here and a thumper here, and back here to hits. But the inside, they have springs. And that little pin right there is what's where the spring rocks. And it doesn't have tendons like ours. And we have these in multiple states of decay. So it's almost like a cat skin. Now, what are we going to do here? I'm So far, I've shown you, I hope, some things. And this is what they would have had originally. This I made this. This is a mud fossil. I, this was only took about six months to make. And um, it's chicken tissue. And you can see it's starting to mineralize. Now, I've still got it around here somewhere. And it's like, like uh, leather now because this is mostly skin. Now, at this point, I didn't know about the hot water flood. I wasn't taking that into consideration. Okay, my friends, this is going to be fun, fun, fun. I just stumbled upon this. Emmanuel Velikowski, Oedipus in Akhenaten. And I was, you know, I studied Velikowski, and I wrote a book about him. I studied him very well. He wrote Worlds in Collision. I realized he was right about most of the things. He wasn't right about everything, but he was right about most of the things, and he was attacked viciously, and this guy is attacking him again, even to this very day. This is two years ago. So I'm loving the content of this. I only got it up to here, three minutes in or something. And I'm going to dispute this guy because I know right away he started off by, yeah, the guy, well, you're going to see what he had to say and you will see what I have to say. So this is Theatro Phil and he is going to disparage my hero, Emmanuel Velikowski, and I shall disparage him. So let's watch and see what he has to say. All right, here he goes. So in this video, we're going to talk about Emmanuel Velikovsky's book, Oedipus and Akhenaten. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you are a big fan of Velikovsky, this is not the video for you. Yes, it is, my friend. It's not the video for you. <laughs> um, this is one of the video, one of the rare videos. I don't normally do this, um, but this, it, it, it's sometimes fun to just get your claws out and rip someone apart. And Velikovsky deserves to be ripped apart. Um, so <laughs> this is not going to be a positive description of Velikovsky's work. <laughs> Wait till you see the description of you, my friend. <laughs> um, that being said, Velikovsky's an interesting cat. Um, he, he dabbled in a lot of different disciplines, and he dabbled. dabbled. He was an expert. He would have no clue what he knew. 
pulled in them badly. <laughs> um, including, in this case, comparing history and mythology. Um, Velkovsky is, or was, uh, since he's no longer with us, uh, Velikovsky was what was known as a catastrophist. Um, and what's inter one of the things that's really interesting about him, um, he often had these ideas that the broad outlines of them were later found to be correct, but almost all of the details were wrong. <laughs> Yeah, everything he said was right, but, you know, the details were wrong. No, See, there might have been a wrong detail here and there, but trust me, you have to understand much more than this guy could possibly ever understand. And Velikovsky understood all of these things, and he went and got read all of the things that everybody wrote, and they all had the same story. So th this is an another denialist guy. I don't know who he is, but I have no respect for him anyway at this point. So, for instance, Velikovsky had this idea that comets and celestial bodies could cause natural disasters on Earth. We now know that's true. Uh, the dinosaurs were almost certainly wiped out by a comet hitting the... That's ridiculous. The dinosaurs, compared to the things that were on this Earth, were parasites. Planet. But... Almost every detail of the arguments that Velikovsky made about the movements of planetary bodies and, and of comets and things like this is wrong. Um, <laughs> physicists and astronomers, people who actually study the movements of planets in the fifth... They're, they're all... They're just ridiculously incompetent. That's why they think space is a vacuum. It's just incredible. And this guy is just another drone that follows, oh, we're heroes, we went to Yale, we went to Harvard, and they just went there to get a piece of paper so somebody would hire them. And, they, and, and now they're, they're the incompetence. They're teaching everybody else. And these guys, oh, I'm so smart, and Velikovsky was so dumb. Well, it's good. <laughs> Physical laws behind them basically came along and were like, this is a cool theory, bro, but um, physics says you're wrong. Yeah, well, I say physics is wrong, and I have the evidence to prove it. <laughs> I love these arrogant people. Planets simply can't move the way that they would have to move. Oh, this is just impossible. Why would he even watch you? Because you're an idiot. Well, <laughs> that's right. I'm watching you so I can show what an idiot you are, my friend for your particular theory to be correct. And this happened basically across the board. Like, a ton of, of stuff that Velikovsky wrote was just disproven by people who actually work in those disciplines. No. They said the guy is insane. They never disproved anything. 60, 60 of his contrary conclusions were proven correct. <laughs> and zero of the attacks against him have any proof whatsoever. And, so, and for that reason, um, Velikovsky's name is often invoked in, an, in a not entirely complimentary way. So in other words, you're a Velikovskian. You have a catastrophic Oh, for idea those who don't know, that's a big insult. So, a big insult. Turning to Oedipus and Akhenaten, his basic theory, his basic argument is that the Greek myth of Oedipus um, had historical origins. It's not just mythology, it's a... It's a modified, reshaped version of historical events. It's no, it's true historical events. You are the people that have no capability to understand what's right in front of your face. And you are the kind of person that 
frankly, I have no respect for because I, I know you've never read anything that Velikovsky wrote. You immediately heard that he said that Jupiter gave birth to Venus, and Venus almost hit Earth and hit Mars and destroyed Mars. And they, oh, it can't be. That's just it's impossible. We all know it's impossible. No, we don't know anything's impossible. I know that your mind is not working. That I know. That's that's an absolute fact. Specifically, historical events surrounding the reign of Pharaoh Akhenaten of Egypt, uh, of the 18th dynasty. Akhenaten is, to me, the most fascinating pharaoh. Uh, he is known as the, the heretic pharaoh or the, the criminal of Akhenaten. Uh, Akhetaten was the city that Akhenaten founded, uh, the new capital city he founded for Egypt. Because Akhenaten, in about the fourth year of his reign, basically decided he was going to revolutionize Egypt. He was going to change the religion. He was going to change the art, uh, the aesthetics. He was going to change the culture. And so the big reform, the big revolution of Akhenaten is the shift from polytheism, the Egyptian pantheon, to monotheism. Akhenaten essentially declared that the only real god was Aten, which was the sun disk. Um, and he built an entire new city, Akhetaten, to be the capital to glorify Aten. Uh, because it was built in a, it was built in a place where no other god had ever been worshipped in Egyptian history, so like this was completely new and it, uh, it overturned almost everything in Egyptian life, which of course a lot of people were not happy with, which is why they call him the heretic king or the criminal of Akhetaten. All right, let's let's just hold off for one second and think. All right. Think about this now. Velikovsky's research said that 3,500 years ago, this was approximately 1500 BC, approximately, there was a catastrophe. Yes, he was a catastrophist. And he said that Venus was literally born as a fiery comet from the feared god Jupiter. Now, this guy is talking about, well, all of a sudden they went from all these different gods who, and they were, they were everywhere here. The mythology is correct. I can sh show this with my mud fossils and Typhon and all the things that were written have very, very serious material evidence to support them. Now, think about this. He said 1,500 years ago, Z Zeus, who was Jupiter, destroyed Earth basically wiped out all these giants and everything. And so what would Akhenaten think about that? He would say, wow, we just got destroyed by one gigantic god. So let's get rid of all these other guys and worship him. Let's throw the spotlight on him so he doesn't do it again. So that's why he went to polytheism or monotheism. Before they had a bunch of them. Polytheism means just a whole batch of different gods. And that is just what was written, and I see no reason to disbelieve it because of Typhon and all the other things I found. Now, that puts this guy just after the Great Flood, a couple hundred years after, or a hundred years after maybe. So he, this is fresh in their memory. They want to change the way they're doing business to appease this guy so he doesn't throw another rock at him. That's what happened. They said, well, dude, this is crazy. Let's all go and worship that guy that just destroyed all the bad guys. And we'll, we'll turn to be very, very religious and very, very devout and, and praise and, and sacrifice and, and build monuments and, you know, adore this, this God. Otherwise, he's going to do the same thing again he just did before. Okay, my friends, we're just going to have a real good time here. Because um, someone here, there's a, a guy on the internet who is assaulting one of the biggest heroes in history who has been assaulted for the last 60 years, 70 years, um, after putting out the truth. And that's what happens with academia. You put out the truth, you're in trouble. 
And I did as well. And of course, I'm not, not in academia, so I didn't really care, but I was mad. And I wrote this book, Mud Fossils, and Velikowski, my hero, and Minds in Collision. He wrote Worlds in Collision, which was about the event that created the Great Flood. And it only happened only approximately 1500 BC. That's only 3500 years ago. Now, when I show you what this guy has to say, it supports everything that Velikovsky said. These people just have no, no common sense. This is what I'm going to show you. He's going after my guy, and I'm going to tell you I'm going to go after him. That's fair. He's the most incompetent person and the most arrogant person that I've seen in uh, in a while now. Most of them have run and hid. They are in hiding because they know they have been wrong all along. This guy acts like, oh, we're so smart. Well, it goes back a couple of years, but it doesn't matter. I've been talking about, well, I wrote this book in 2015. So at that point, he started to come back to life again. I mean, he was gone. Nobody knew about him, and everybody that did could treat him like an idiot. They still do because of people with the mindset of this arrogant, incompetent that you will see uno momento. <laughs> this does go back two years, but I just put this up just just a second ago. I said, hello, whatever his name is, so-and-so Phil. I am about to tear you to shreds. Attack my hero and I attack you. If he was alive, you would be lunch. And this is the dessert, which will be on my channel. So, what is this arrogant, incompetent with this little hat on, his little scarf and all this fancy, he thinks he's, that makes him somebody smart and he's showing his little suits on the side here. Well, a couple of little books over here I can read. Well, let's see, this guy, I, I didn't get far into it. I only got up to here, but that was enough for me to go on the attack big time. So let's just see what he has to say about my hero. He says, I'm going to tell you right now, listen to this. Let me turn it up so nobody misses anything, because this is going to be Roger's revenge. Here it goes. Dan Velikovsky, this is not the video for you. Uh, this is one of the video, one of the rare videos. I don't normally do this, um, but this, it, it, it's sometimes fun to just get your claws out and rip someone apart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, it is. And Velikovsky deserves to be ripped apart. Um, so, this is not going to be a positive description of Velikovsky's work. Um, that being said, Velikovsky is an interesting cat. Um, he, so he dabbled in a lot of different disciplines and... He didn't dabble. He was an expert at everything that he took on. He didn't do what you do. He just dismiss things. I am also an expert. And I dabble in everything. So you want to call it dabble? Good. He dabbled in them badly. No, you dabble in reality badly. Um, including in this case, comparing history and mythology. Um, Velikovsky is, or was, uh, since he's no longer with us. And able to speak up against incompetence such as you. Uh, Velikovsky was what was known as a catastrophist. Um, and what's interesting, one of the things that's really interesting about him, um, he often had these ideas that the broad outlines of them were later found to be correct. You know, I'm, I'm going to shut him down for right now. And he's, he's going to say, yeah, he found everything was right. But, oh, he didn't have any of the little details right. He had everything right. Well, not everything, not 100%. Nobody's got 100% right. But he did the work and knew that all the cultures in the, in the world had the same story, 1500 BC-ish, BC the world was wiped out. 
And at that time, there was a, a pantheon of gods. There was a god for this and a god for that. There was a god of the waters, a god of the skies, a god of everything. And then the earth almost was destroyed by what they considered to be the main god who was Zeus and he was also Jupiter and he sent Venus from his body which is Jupiter he gave birth to Venus which almost hit Earth and then hit Mars all recorded by every culture on the Earth that had any astrological astro astronomy interests but all of them had the same story about the flood and the devastation to the earth. Very few people survived, but the ones that did, they recorded this. Now, so now, Velikovsky finds out that Akhenaten <coughs> was what they call a, 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 a heretic to the gods. And he said, we're going to worship one god from now on, the one that just has wiped out everything on earth. He said, hey, we're going to sacrifice to and put, bend on our knees to, which is Zeus, which is Jupiter, which was the god of the Old Testament. He was the one that destroyed the giants and created a flood. Okay, I think the best way to do this is just to take some time, because this is my hero, Emmanuel Velikovsky. He was correct. He was destroyed by academia. And people like this guy here are still trying to tarnish his sterling abilities. And I'm not going to go along with it. And these, this guy is arrogant and he's incompetent. He's exactly like Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan was the most arrogant, incompetent celebrity in science. He, he was, uh, every time I saw him, I, I really had to be careful I didn't vomit. And this guy, I'm not feeling so good either. Hold on, here we go. But almost all of the details were wrong. So, for instance, Belkovsky had this idea that comets and celestial bodies could cause natural disasters on Earth. We now know that's true. <laughs> we all know that's true. However, uh, the dinosaurs were almost certainly wiped out by a comet hitting the planet. See, here's the key. He has no clue about dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were literally, and I'm not kidding you, they were the parasites that were on the large creatures that were on this Earth. The sea serpents that were eating boats and so forth were literally intestinal parasites that could no longer live in their dead hosts and evacuated their dead hosts and went into the ocean in search of sustenance, which became sailors. But almost every detail of the arguments that Velikovsky made about the movements of planetary bodies and, and of comets and things like this is wrong. There you go again. Let's just see what the experts have to say. The experts that don't know that space is not a vacuum, they have no clue it's not a vacuum. It's just it's stunning how incompetent these people we are, are like him. Listen to this. Um, physicists and astronomers, people who actually study the movements of planets and the physical laws behind them. I'm going to tell you right now, they don't study them. They study the textbooks that they were told to say, and the more they said about it, and the more they could repeat, and they get some Max Planck, and this one, and that one, and Dirac, and Fermi, and, you know, wow, what a hero he is. That's the kind of hero this guy is. He's a, he's a drone. Basically came along and were like, this is a cool theory, bro, but uh, bro. physics says you're wrong. Planets simply can't move the way that they would have to move for your particular theory to be correct. Let me tell you something. How do you feel about Einstein there, Mr. Genius? You think it could, we can accelerate light and slow it down? Einstein was, was wrong? You think that's possible? Well, I can guarantee you it is, because we do it right now, Mr. Genius. You know, I don't want to be nasty. I really don't. But these these people with these arrogant attitudes like him, I, I was just, 
I could see what kind of an arrogant, incompetent person it is, because that's that's exactly how they come across. Well, I am so nice, and it's, I'm never like this to some idiot like this guy, Velikovsky. This is what irks the hell out of me. They try to act so, oh, I'm so nice. And he's such an idiot, it's too bad I have to point out he's such an idiot. Well, let me tell you something. Let me talk about Einstein. You want to talk about idiots? I don't, I, you know, I hate to assault anybody, I really do, but that's light coming forward, that's light accelerating. They can't handle this. I want to talk to Mr. Genius there about that. That's ex acceleration. Why should we listen to the scientists? Why should we listen to the physicists? This is light slowing down. It's coming in fast and slowing down. They have no clue what they're talking about. The geologists, the people in space, they no idea that space is saturated with particles. Light is slowing down. It can easily slow down. We can accelerate and speed it up. We can create fission and fusion right there. That's fission, that's fusion. The black and white particles, which are these black and white particles right here that are normally attached together, break apart and you end up with a white shower, which is the electron shower, supposed to be trillions of electron volts, and the black particles don't don't go through there because this, we created a special venturi. Now, how would Mr. Uh, Hotshot here like to talk about that? Let's get some physicists. Let's get some geologists. Let's get some of these people that are making all these claims, like like Hotshot here, to talk to Roger, because I have the information that shows that virtually every one of these people's people-lizzisms are just, you know, just the repeaters of nonsense. And Max Planck said, science advances one funeral at a time. <laughs> they got to just die off before the next guy comes along. And, he, and even then, you can't speak. Velikovsky's been proven right for over 60 years, and this guy here is still assaulting him. And they, everybody does. The only reason I, well, I did write the book. I think I showed, I wrote a book about him. And, and uh, I'm clearing his name, because he was the hero, and these guys are the zeros. All right, I don't know how I'm going to possibly be able to be able to watch this after seeing how arrogantly incompetent this guy is. And this happened basically across the board. Like a ton of, of stuff that Velikovsky wrote was just disproven by people who actually work in those disciplines. And so, and for. That's just the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. All, virtually everything he said came to pass. There's another one New York Times, 40 years after Velikovsky. This is 1987. Don't take him seriously. He was just a nutcase. You see this? Velikovsky's theories live on, unfortunately. Some additional examples of correct prognosis. But this was Velikovsky is right. All right. How, and they talk about the Earth possibly stopped rotating when we almost got impacted by Venus. And that's for, for, very possible. Because it would push our atmosphere this way and we hit... Uh, and it would, because it's almost the same size as Earth. So it could very possibly have almost literally stopped the Earth from spinning. But the Earth would start spinning again because it is scrubbing everything it's going through, creating that spin. That's what makes them spin on their axis. That's why it spins pretty much a regular 24 hour day because it's got to plow through everything and, and it rubs it and just like pushing it like a merry-go-round coming around and pushing it and spinning. As, they go through, as it comes through the space of all the particles, which they don't even know about. Now, when is NASA going to admit that Emmanuel Velikovsky was right? All right, I just want to mention this. This goes way back to 1952, which he has been really assaulted in so badly, Velikovsky. Now, it says, on the horizon, the meteoric Velikovsky. All right. And he, Joshua, said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou, moon, in the... And this is a biblical text. That's why they were after him so bad, because he was talking about 
these biblical things. Now, I'm talking about myth mythological things, the same thing as far as I'm concerned. They both have had the same stories. Now, just when everyone is pretty much recovered from the excitement of worlds in collision, that saga of the ancient encounter between Comet Venus and the planet Earth, which almost hit, as a result of which the Earth stood still for a day, Emmanuel Velikowski shortly be in the news again with his second book, Ages in Chaos. Jared Wilk, after long interviews with Velikowski, remains unable to judge the merits of the scientific controversies. Now, I am a scientific person. I will show, and then they can judge the merits of what I have to say, now that there is new evidence to support Velikowski. So, the guy that, that critiqued him, was unable really to understand the scientific merits because they don't understand electron flood theory and they don't understand mud fossils. I will bring those two things into this mix and it changes the complexity of everything. So he couldn't, he couldn't do it, uh, it, which is the controversies his writings had provoked. They're, I mean, they were controversial. They were screaming and yelling and they tried, they took his book off the bookshelves. They actually forced the publisher to take the book off the bookshelves because the academics were so upset. So he did find Dr. Velikowski to be a person of more than common interest. He was into everything. I'm into everything too. And if you're not, you're not into anything because everything sits on top of something else. There is nothing that sits all by itself and hello, and it just it sits out there. No, everything is like this. No. And this, so he goes into this stuff about in his Worlds in Collision book and about the things that were written in the Bible about this time frame. Now this was 1500 BC and right after that, that was supposedly the, the feared god Jupiter, which is Zeus, gave birth to Venus, which popped out of the red spot and came to Earth and almost smashed into Earth, caused huge catastrophe, killed all the giants, and I mean caused all kinds of catastrophe, and then went on and hit Mars. So what happened was Akhenaten realized how powerful this god was that did this, because he, he said, I'm going to do this, get Noah, build a chest, which is the ark, the boat, and he said, the rest of them, out they go. And so they knew that this was a god that could do this. So they said, no more other gods. Forget all those other gods about the sky and the moon and the love and hate and all those other gods. Forget them. We are worshiping from now on one god. And that was, he was the new heretic pharaoh that said, you know, we got to, and they built all kinds of temples to him, giving all kind of, you know, tribute and so forth, and sacrifices saying, we love you, we love you, we love you. Please don't throw a rock at us again. You know, and that's what happened. He literally popped out a planet out of the red spot, which literally is a vagina. No, I think something messed up with my camera, but here's what I, w I believe I was showing this. And that, I, I'm almost certain, was this shot from right here. On, and that from this lung. And it just shows how dense with blood and so forth. And that has a lot of metals in it. Now, don't forget this here, if they ground it up, you'd end up with like, these are these are tendons. Now that doesn't have a, ten, a lot of tendinous material in it along. But they, it appears to me they're grinding up the whole body. Because this would be, the, the, the really bloody stuff would be the most beneficial for them. But then they were taking the tendons, which are these guys right here, all of these little things, and the muscles all together, grinding up. I showed you that guy that was wielding the wheel. And um, I think that's how they made the uh, Great Wall of China. They used, they did say they, they had a secret ingredient. <laughs> and I think they said it was blood. Okay, so what sense can we make of this? Well, at one time, we know that there was a plethora of gods that were worshipped. Everybody had t tons of different gods all over the earth. They had their own gods and multiple ones. And almost all of them had multiple, like this guy and a god of the ocean, a god of the this and the that, but boom. Now, then all of a sudden, 
3,500 years ago, one God. And according to Velikovsky, and according to everything that I can determine in the ancient texts that he showed evidence for, it was all basically rooted in fact that we were had this devastating event. And again, I keep referring back to Yale because I presented all my evidence to them for years. And, and finally, they wrote a paper saying, well, here it is right here. Hold on a second. Here it is right there. This is Derek Briggs, the one I was working with. Exceptional preservation of soft-bodied creatures promoted by silica-rich oceans. Etocarda biota. Biota just means, you know, creatures and, and bodies and plants and everything. And they say it was a worldwide, complex, macroscopic, multicellular organisms, which is what I'm just showing you, worldwide, one layer, a strata, worldwide, one thin layer, and they don't know how the fossils re got preserved, but they are perfectly exceptional preservation. Now, what is later does it say here about this? It was from the Great Flood. It says that um, the preservation was due to rapid early stage precipitation. Well, rapid precipitation. Let's show with that. Rapid water. They say precipitation. I say water. Was it always from precipitation? Could it have come up from under the ground? It could have been either way. However, it was also from the impact of Venus into our gaseous envelope, which is high hydrogens and oxygens, primarily at the outer edges, and it crushed them together just like it does when you get a high pressure system and you get rain. Same thing happened here. You go, and then it created this precipitation, rapid, worldwide, precipitation creating silica cements and high silica saturation exactly what I talk about because of the chemistry which I fully understand and this was in the oceans creating the bio mineralizers all right the silicates are the bio mineralizers every single one of these fascia coatings or membranes they consist of Phospho bilipids. What does phospho mean? Phosphorus. Phosphorus. When it converts down, it converts just to a, a, a molecule, just smaller, aluminum silicates. Aluminum silicates, 100% of feldspar, 100% of feldspar is made from aluminum silicates, and then there's other little inclusions. And can I show this in chemistry? Absolutely. There's your, uh, I'm sorry, here's your phosphorus, P. Right under that is silicates, silicon. Right under that is aluminum. And what is feldspar? It's aluminum silicates bonded as the phosphor membranes drop down. Because this is the membrane. That's the membrane. That's what's preserving them. As they cooked, the phosphorus of the membranes somehow converted into aluminum silicates. And it, I think it did that probably because of some transition metals or whatnot. But this is precisely what Yale said. This is in 2016, November 2016. I wrote my book about all of this in 2015, and it was published in, I think, January 2016. And, um, and this was after working with Derek Briggs for years. Now, I wasn't mentioned in this, but um, this was literally what I presented to him. This was my work. And they still really, at this point, don't understand it. And I certainly do, as you can see. Now, as I show you, all of my mud fossils, almost all of them, are coated with aluminum tectosilicate minerals, which is feldspar. They're all coated with feldspar. I've shown them to all the geologists. Yeah, well, it's just feldspar. Now, I have a friend, uh, Jim Bolin, who was a senior environmental scientist with the Army Corps of Engineers working for the government. He understands this stuff intimately. He has no, no argument with anything that I have said. None. Zero. And his name's Jim Bolin. And again, he certified bridges and dams and all kinds of things for the structural integrity 
of the bases. Now you got to know what you're doing. <laughs> well, you damn sure better. Or um, you know, and they've for the most part. I don't think he's ever had one collapse that I know of. <laughs> so you got to understand what's on top. Now they're starting to worry about what's underneath the earth, and because of all these weather changes and these high water saturation, what is what's being undercut? We know it's all running off in the rivers, but we also know there's a ton of places that things can flush out from under. If they had enough moisture going through there, running out, would they create bigger and bigger and bigger cavities and phew, and then have a collapse? Well, that's possible. There's all kinds of things that are possible now. You can't rule anything out anymore because nobody realized what the earth was made of until now. It's made out of creatures' bodies. They had huge orifices in them, which was veins and arteries and digestive systems. That's the cave networks all over the earth. We got to face up to the reality of the earth that we're living on and the universe we're living in. And this, this um, work that Velikovsky did should not go the way it has gone, which was is to be avoided and demeaned, and uh, and I, I, how this all started was this was a guy attacking Velikovsky. I was going to do a real nasty video about it, but I've given up on the nastiness. You know, they know not what they do. Trust me, but they will find out because there is this stuff was real, and these statements that were made in these ancient texts are going to come to pass or already have. As far as I'm concerned, that is what you should be researching and, and studying, is what was actually said about things, not what these people are telling you. All right, so anyway, I'm, I'm going to try to stay positive on this. But this is what all these mud fossils are made of. And like I said, I was going to call it fascia facilitated fossilization. That was 10 years ago. But then I decided, well, it, it appeared to be in the mud. The mud is what preserved them mostly. But what the mud did was it acted almost like flesh. Mud is no more than flesh, boiled away flesh. So if this sits in the mud, flat as a pancake, again, surrounded by mud and water, whatever can flow through there will. And this is a membrane, and the membranes allow things in and out. If it's dead, the stuff goes in, and if it can find somebody to attach to, it stays there. It, before, it would be kicked back out again because of its, it would drop off something and pick something up, drop it off and pick it up. The blood would keep flowing. Now the blood has stopped. It's settled. Is it coming down this way and just settling into this? That happens, and when that happens, they're opals. Okay, I mentioned opals. Here's how an opal forms. This is a heart. That's the aorta right there, that big aorta. And, and there's a ton of, obviously, blood in the heart. Now, what does blood have in it? It has all the transition metals. And what would it look like if, if all the transition metals were there? Here's what it would look like right here. That's a heart in opal. And this died in heavy silicates that were transitioning through this, this boiled out body part. And all the transition metals that were in the blood, this is like a saturated blood area. And that's all that was funneling through here was transition metals. Now, they, a certain type of transition metals wants to be attached to the ventricle walls and the heart strings and all that stuff. Other ones want to be attached to other membranes. Other ones want to be attached around muscle fibers. Other ones want to be attached around the, the tubing. It's all different. Other ones want to be attached around the outside. So that's all different blood chemistry finding a partner to stabilize with. So this is a saturated blood situation. Now, I have also, well, you saw what this looks like, right? And that is what this heart looks like, right? And oops, I also have a heart here. But mine is what's called water opal. You see that? That's the same. That's the spot right there. This is the ventricle wall. You see it right down here? All right, it's a little, and this is a, a bloody spot over here or somewhere. I don't know. Maybe over here or whatever. But this is, this is basically a heart. And um, 
it did not have the, the, the transition metals. There was no blood. So it filled up with silicates. Other things fill up with silicates too, just like this right here. Selenite. You know what that is right there? That, my friends, is a tendon and that is the abrupt transition and this little mineralization is the glue that literally glues the tendon to the next segment. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Somebody sent me this, uh, uh, boy, I can't remember, it was years ago. Uh, I'm not going to make any statements. I can't remember, but I thank her for very much. She sent me several of these pieces. And this is an abrupt transition. So, you know, I when I present things, I present evidence to go, and here's another heart, and here's what's inside this heart. Same thing. It's, it's Again, this is all op uh, water opal. So if there had been a lot of transition metals in here, they would be all colors, and they would have found the correct, like, see, this is white, and this is brown, and this is a different color, and all, you know, they all have a different bonding requirement to make them stable, and that's what this one was. It found stability. Whoops. Where did my heart go? All the different types of membranes and and tissues had different requirements of different metals. That's all it is, transition metals. All right, if you want to do a little research on your own, look up transition metals and what they do in the body. These oxidation states carry things around, drop them off, go back with something else, drop that off, pick something else. They are transitioning molecules, and, and they have these different oxidation states which make them attractive to different types of minerals and, and you know glucose and you know calcium and all these other things and they travel through the body in aqueous solutions and they have ligands ligands are little pinchers that pinch and they carry around drop it off i give you this you give me two of those i give you three of these you give me one of those it's, it's as simple as that and that's what makes your body function all day long these are the transition metals, and that's why we find them in all the body chemistry. You find them in all the, all the um, mud fossils. And here's another opal. Here's an eye. <laughs> there's a strap that goes to the eye, and that's a pretty good size eye. I mean, that's you know, that's, well, that's a pretty good size. Now, but that, that's not really big. But it, but but the point I'm making here is, you see all these different colors. They have a different requirement for a different type of transition metal which are these metals and when the metal comes down there it has nowhere else to go and it says if, you, if I stay with you we can get stable and I say all right come on down and bring all your buddies down and I have a bunch of buddies we'll all get together and form an eyeball that'll be yellow <laughs> I don't know this is it's a it's a crazy world right now all right but there's there's your your basic heart and they have all the plumbing, the same stuff. Basically the same thing I'm showing here. Oh, I have a ton of hearts. Hearts preserve well, lungs preserve well. The blood is the thing, it's the best preservative. It, it, it sounds crazy, but it's true. And here's the Mitchell Hedges, is no question whatsoever. These fibers are the same fibers that are inside this skull. Nobody carved that. This was laying on its face this way and they watch here's what happened you see the the brain in the back here it drifted forward there it is right there you see open up this cavity to just be invaded by silicates this right here is this right here see this right here is this right here this is his nose now nobody would carve a nose and all squish back like this and the lip squish back. And why would that lip be there if all the rest of the flesh was gone? The reason is it died in the mud probably up to about here. And the leaching chemistry did not get to this area, but it got everywhere else, down to the bonish stuff. And then that must have gone away and then it got filled with silicates and this got transitioned into silicates even though it was a lip 
it, everything else, even the teeth, you see? So, so w nucleophilic substitution in certain cases can be absolutely stunningly effective to, to, to transition things into other things. Let me bring this back the way it's supposed to be. But you see that? I mean, did the teeth, it did the bones, it did the nerves, but the nerves are different. Nerves and the, the surrounding nerve um, insulation is, is must be very, 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 you know, tough. Something's, something's different about it. Now, I was looking at these fibers, and you see how they change colors? It's, it's, if this is real, this is very interesting. If we could, because there's a lot of people that have neurological problems, and this is your neurological systems all controlled basically here and in your gut. There's a nerve um, brain um, gut axis. The two of them work together. And your brain tells your gut what it needs, apparently, for enzymes and body parts and whatever it does. But they, there is a, a connection there. And if these fibers are not well insulated or they're not working right or something's wrong about the chemistry, and I don't know what it could be exactly, but I would suspect it's the, 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 the I think they call it a myelin sheath, which surrounds the nerve fibers to keep them from getting or not transitioning or whatever it does. But it's 100% chemistry. There is nothing in your body that happens it doesn't happen because of an enzyme. An enzyme's the only thing that works fast enough to create the chemistry to make your body function. They do half-lifes of hundreds of thousands of molecules in a second. They break them down just like that. And they build them up just like that. Within an instant, what is called click chemistry, it comes up with a whole batch of magnetism to it, and it goes, and everything in there is affected speedily. All this magnetism, bang, click, done. And that kills tumors. It creates food for you. It breaks down carrots and everything else. You eat. you're, not, you're not eating a carrot, and it goes into you as a carrot. It goes into you as the components that made that carrot up. That's why all this GMO foods and things like that, I'm a little skeptical on all that stuff. I'd like to see what the chemistry breaks down to and what enzymes you need to break it down. Because I'm sure that if something isn't genetically modified, that means it's going to make something different. Genes are not just genes. They're programs. And what are they programmed? They program molecules to become certain things. Now, they're putting stuff in there to say, don't worry about pesticides, don't worry about toxins, just keep growing. Is, does that mean it is absorbing the toxins and it's fine with them and we're going to eat them as in the toxins are going to come into us? They've modified it to not worry about becoming infected? I think that's the case. Otherwise, you know, they've put Roundup on these things and all kinds of stuff that kills the weeds. Well, that, that's, you're, you're growing in your gut is 100% loaded with weeds. That's what bacteria is. It's basically the same thing. It's, a, it's living little bacteria and, and little growing things inside of you. And once you eat something that kills them, you're in trouble. Now, antibiotics kill them. I suppose Roundup probably would. You eat a bowl of Roundup, you're probably not going to do too well. Anything that kills that bacteria is a health hazard to you. I'm going to leave it at that. I've been talking about this for a long time. And fecal matter transplants, which are safe, effective, and FDA approved now for certain conditions, are, I think, the solution to these invasive diseases which are caused by the lack of enzymes, which are caused by the lack of bacteria, which are caused by some kind of invasive chemistry that's caused your gut to be in a bad shape. And usually you'll know about it because you'll be, have constipation or diarrhea or distress or acid reflux or some other chronic condition that indicates that you're being invaded. 
And the only way you can stop that invasion is with enzymes. And the enzymes can only be there if there's bacteria. And the bacteria can only be there if they're living there. And they're living in that interstitium layer. Now, I, again, I drag everything together. Again, nothing sits by itself. So we got history, we got chemistry, we got granite blocks, we got stone heads, we got opals, we got everything. This is, this is the way you do research. Because if you don't put the pieces together, you have one piece, you have, you, there's no puzzle. The puzzle is, is never going to be put together. You have to be able to associate. People look at this, they laugh at, at, at The scientists will laugh at you and say, oh, that's somebody carved that. Right out of hand. Same thing happened to us when we had the head scanned at the University of Texas. As, as Yale said, you'd have to have that done. Hold on a second. All right, to answer John's question about red granite, there is natural red granite, but this kind, what you would call granite, is not natural. That's ground up. It's a polymer. Somebody like this guy ground it up. Now, this is a natural body part. I believe it's a lung. They might call that red granite. This is also a lung. Flat as a pancake on one side, just like all of them, and that is a lung, and that they might slice that up and call that red granite. All right, this is another lung. That might be called red granite. Again, flat, silicates all invaded where the t plumbing was that fed the airwaves. I got them coming on. I got all kinds of stuff that could be considered red granite. Well, here's here, right. Look at this. That's about as red granite as you get. But I'm going to tell you right now, that is a body part. And I believe it's, it could be a, a liver. Or, I'm not sure what it is, but, but it's completely nu nucleophilically transitioned. But there is a nucleus in here of some sort. I don't know exactly what this body part was. But when they transition completely, there's something going on there. If you can see that. Sometimes they so, so completely transition that you can't tell what was where. It, everything is about the conditions where when it was entombed. And again, I get these giant, this is giant hair follicle. And that's the erector pili muscle. That's the sebaceous gland. That's where the root hair comes down. Vein and artery. The hair shaft coming up. Flat on one side means it was from a curly-haired person. Just put in put in a hair follicle and that's where the muscle attaches makes your hands has hair stand up there's where the sebaceous gland is so and this is big I mean that's big for a hair follicle so I think I've demonstrated basically everything that I have to and this is where my countertops come from is right in, in this area here they ground it all up and then they flushed it all out and mostly only left was the the um, tendinous material? Is it, that's the toughest, toughest, toughest stuff on our planet. You see it right here. That's almost all that's left here. That's the only piece of metal I could find really. And I, you know, I, I didn't search every inch. There's a lot of ca uh, counter, uh, but here it is right up close. If that's not tendon, I don't know what it is. And it's chopped right off. They're not supposed to be like that. And all of the red blood is just sort of gooey in there and the black blood has turned into chunks of blackness you see the chunks of, this is exactly what you the hematite is the black blood the red blood stays really fluidy and just sort of gooey the black blood just turns hard rock hard that's iron hematite I mean magnetite the other stuff is the hematite and it's sort of running red blood now um I don't think I showed you this yet, which is, this is another lung right here. Now, I showed you my lung over here, which is saturated with blood too. It's completely saturated. Now, this one though, died laying like this. And some of the red blood ran out in the bottom, and some of the black blood, because you got both in your lungs. So you got oxygenated and deoxygenated. So. What are we looking at here? You might call that black granite or um, red granite or whatever you want to call it, granite. But you see all these little holes? 
Let me show you what this looks like in a microscope. I put a little water on here, but all of this is the fascia, and the blood has just leaked out because it was upside down. Now, let's put a little water on it, because that always makes things stand out a little better. You see, already you can see a lot more detail. You see that? All right, so we're going to put it under the microscope. Flatten it up a little bit here. All right, how's that? All right, now, we're going to be looking it up in the, uh, up here. I have to turn the lights off and so forth and focus it in. Hold on. All right, this would be, you could consider this natural red granite, but these are all the little blood vessels and these are all the um, vein. So you got red is the hematite and the black is the magnetite, but that's the two different oxygen, oxygenation states of blood. And this is that lung. Uh, and it's, it, that's the stuff that's leaking out all over. Now I could probably put some catalase on here and look for a reaction. Now here's where the fascia meets right up to what's underneath it. Hold on a second. You see, this would have coated all that, but the blood leaked through. And that's what we're seeing here is just blood. All right, I'm, I'm going to do the catalase test. And what is that? If this is truly blood and it still has any of the blood enzymes in it, this hydrogen peroxide, as it penetrates in there, it will liberate bubble in bubbles of oxygen. Now, sometimes it takes a few minutes, but this is a, a good spot. I just washed it off. It's still a little damp. I'm going to put some, some um, hydrogen peroxide in there, and let's see what happens. Let's see if we see any reaction down here. Now, I can already see it, I think. Let me come right down on top of here. Because they're going to be tiny, tiny, tiny bubbles. Yep, she's bubbling. Look at them. This puppy's got all kind of blood coming out of here. That is a, a reaction by the enzyme in a living, living biology. You see that bubbling out of there? That's bubbling out of that, that blood in this lung. Let me put a little more on there. See? See it over here? That's, that's blood. You don't see it doing over there. What happens is catalase liberates oxygen. Look at that puppy. And they will start to really start to liberate a lot as it gets cooking. I'm just going to shut this off for a minute, but you can see all of a sudden it'll start bubbling like crazy. You know, you got to get down through all the tissues that were, you know, I mean, this thing's probably 3,500 years ago. This is from because of the Great Flood. But you can see these enzymes are still working quite well. Look at this baby. See it bubbling away? Red blood just gives us off. There's a guy on the internet that takes a, 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 like a pint or a quart of pig's blood or something, and he takes a cup full of uh, peroxide and he dumps it in there and it, whoosh, it just fluffs up like just unbelievable. It almost explodes. You see how it's starting to get down deep inside now? We're going to start seeing some pretty good reactions. Anyway, um, 
that just shows you that this was a living blood system at one time. 